Character designs, performance, voice direction. What is there to say about Xenoblade Chronicles 2 that hasn't been said before? Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a beautiful game, yet showcases flaws that makes a lot of players give up, simply because the game lacks a lot of polish that it deserves. Today, I'm not going to be talking about any of that. Today, I want to highlight the highs that Xenoblade Chronicles 2 manages to achieve. Five years later. First of all, what makes Xenoblade Chronicles 2 different from Xenoblade Chronicles 1? First of all, characters are given a much heavier emphasis in the story this time. Rex and Pyra of course are given the most screen time and character development, but other characters like Malos, Zeke, Tora, and Nia all have extensive backstories. I won't go over all the characters as there's too many great characters in this game, but Monolith Soft has done a great job here. Rex has a lot going against him. He has a goofy design, a goofy laugh, a goofy personality, and a goofy sword going straight through him. Rex is one of my favorite characters in the entire franchise, since I feel like he's very well written and likable. Throughout the story, we see him try to be the hero and try to be strong, but as we see throughout the story, he's still growing up. He still needs his friends to help support him, like when he loses all hope when he loses against Torna, or the kitchen scene with Pyra and Mithra. Rex may not be my favorite protagonist anymore, but he's still the best written one in the entire series. He has a lot at stake, and he struggles with that. Oh, and he instantly becomes a better character when he's revealed to have three wives? Honestly, I only expected him to marry Pyra, and maybe Mithra, but not Nia. Either way, it shows that Rex is the biggest child of all of us. One of my favorite things about Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is Rex. Rex, to me, is the perfect protagonist for the story. I felt fully immersed when playing as it, and it made the game a hundred times better. Xenoblade 2 for me would be a way worse game if Rex wasn't the main. Damn shame that it's actually not a common opinion. I really do think Rex is one of the most underrated protagonists in all of gaming. 500 years ago, Torno was destroying a war that would traumatize many. Mithra would turn into Pyra, sealing away her past. She would also be sealed away, so that these events would never happen again. Pyra is a kind soul and cares deeply for Rex, her new driver. I'd end up adoring her, even if she had that weird scene in Gormot. Pyra is kind and caring, and I love her so much because of that. And also because I really like romantic subplots in movies, TV shows, and video games. Since Pyra was made so Mithra wouldn't have to face the world again, she was built to be loving. She holds Mithra's trauma and guilt and she's a fantastic character. Mithra, on the other hand, is completely different. She's rude, mean, and did I say this already? Rude. This does make sense though, as in Torna the Golden Country, her driver Adam is revealed to be expecting a baby soon, so Mithra embodies what Adam thinks his daughter could be like. What would you do if your loved one was dying in front of you, and there was absolutely nothing you could do about it? Jin is a tragic villain that I adore. He's suffering, and he lost the most important person in his life, who he was supposed to protect. Jin would join the very enemy he fought before, because Laura died in his hands. He would take her heart, and with that- <laughs> And with that, became a Blade Eater, who is now immortal. Jin is very similar to N, but better in a lot of ways. His story is one of tragedy, and it's a cycle that continues in the franchise again and again. I think my favorite thing about Xenoblade 2 is the art, and <laughs> I'm probably one of the few people who actually like the art style. And it's both the character designs as well as how the world looks. One particular motif that I really like, and it's the green and the blues used for the ether lines. Not, well, not just ether lines, but also just ether particles that flow around in the air. Like you see it in the world tree, you see it on the blades characters in the form of ether lines, you see 
you see it everywhere. And there's a constant thing that is that you just see throughout the story and it's just really pretty to look at. <laughs> Is this story as good as the original Z-Blade Chronicles? Hmm. No. But even then, the story found in Z-Blade Chronicles 2 is something that I cherish. The world of all rest is falling apart, and tension is rising between all of the nations. Uri and Mor Ardain are one step away from war, and Torna, a terrorist organization, has risen to capture Pyra, an Aegis who fell 500 years ago. As said before, the story is said to have a slow opening, and two playthroughs later, I do agree. The tutorials, which are terrible, makes combat to be sluggish in the beginning, and even big things don't truly happen until the gang gets Uriah, which is when Mithra, Pyro's original alter ego, appears and saves the day. In this video game, the story has a much bigger focus on the characters, like I said before. Now nearly all of the characters in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 have a part in the story, where they're very important. Appearing goofy at first, Zeke and Pandora actually end up being revealed as incredibly important characters and have serious story moments. The same thing happens with Tora, with the whole chapter being dedicated to his father. I can go on and on, but that's a part of why I like the story in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 so much. It feels so much more connected than the previous games. The tone, unfortunately, makes it hard to appreciate some parts of the story where it should hit. I love Xenoblade Chronicles 2 a ton, but sometimes it can take something too far, to the point where it's uncomfortable. in my bed. Wait! Uh... Ah! Get out! Interloper! Monster! W wait a minute, would you? No! And one of my favourite things about Senior Blade 2, in particular in comparison to the rest of that whole series, is its very distinct tone. What I mean by that is, for me personally, Senior Blade 1 has this almost old-timey, grim fairy tale kind of vibe. And if you've read an old-timey fairy tale, you'll understand what I mean by that. Meanwhile, Xenoblade Blade 3 is more fugitives on the run and mystery, almost. Meanwhile, Xenoblade Blade 2 has this almost duo tune thing going on, uh, with one half being kind of a whimsical, light-hearted adventure story. And you get a lot of that in early titans like Uriah and Gorma and whatnot, uh, while the other half is kind of a post-apocalyptic kind of heavily influenced by the past kind of deal and it almost feels like those two being weighed up against each other and you clashing is kind of the point of the entire game. Uh, you see it reflected a lot in the dichotomy between Rex and Amalthus and Malice by extension and Pyra and Mithra and just the main party and Torna I suppose. Um, this optimism and pessimism kind of end of the world, save the world kind of deal is right at the core of the story and it really does feel like eternal struggle that's represented a lot in a lot of different ways throughout the game. And I really hope that if we get more Xenoblade Blade games in the future, which we should, hopefully, uh, we get a lot more that are eternally interesting in that way with a lot of distinct features. The idea of pushing one set of feelings and tones and themes up against another one to kind of see how they react and see how they struggle and see how they fight. I just think that's super interesting and I hope we get more of it in the future. So, many may not know this, but I actually dislike Xenoblade 2 quite a lot. However, as the nice fan artists over on Pixiv have proven, there's plenty to enjoy about this game for... Yeah, you can imagine. I, however, enjoy the far more stupider things about it. So, there's this insanely funny speedrun trick called Zombie Walk, where... You use this super weird button combo of holding down all the triggers, X, and down on the D-pad, which allows you to kill your entire party. I would imagine was used to get out of soft locks and stuff like that. However, if you fall off, say, a small ledge, you can essentially use it to skip massive areas, like shown here in Tantal. Unfortunately, you miss out on Tantal, which... It's... It's theme? It's a banger! I'll actively hunt your address and dox you if you somehow think that one's combat is better than two's. I can admit that the tutorials and the UI makes combat harder to understand, and that Monolith Soft are terrible at making tutorials. It's hard to make a fair case for Monolith when they put tutorials on the D-pad. The tutorials in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is so bad to the point where Monolith Soft just had to shove them in her face in Xenoblade Chronicles 3. It's probably worth it to be honest, because now it's actually easier to master the battle system in the game. But here, unfortunately, they just left it. Actually getting to know the game better shows that there's a lot to love here. Compared to the previous two games, the combat system has been completely overhauled. 
in a more action-focused approach, and it's awesome for that. It allows for better and more tactical combat, with blade switching, driver combos, and arc cancels that feel amazing to use. This all would build a foundation for the sequel. It still feels great here. Instead of 8 active arts and a talent arc to use, there are now 3 driver arts per blade and up to 4 blade specials that are used to destroy the enemy. At first glance, just 3 driver arts mapped to the face buttons might seem a little too little, but now we're able to equip 3 blades, which if you count correctly, you're able to use 21 arts, including specials, to use in battle. That brings a lot to the table and makes combat much more interesting. Certain blades also have unique abilities, which makes combat more fun, of course. Overall, while the blade system might be limiting sometimes, it's overall still pretty great. Break, topple, launch, smash. Replacing the Days combo from Xenoblade Chronicles comes a brand new and improved combo known as a smash combo that's more focused on overall damage, and man, it's awesome. Launching an enemy makes it stop doing everything, and you're able to get more attacks in without risking anything. It's a great way to hurt the enemy more, and overall it feels amazing to use. Making the battle system even more interesting, all of your blades now have elements. By using blade specials over time, you can eventually execute a blade combo, which leaves a colored orb flying around an enemy. Using a driver combo during a blade combo leads to fusion combos, which does even more damage, but honestly, I wouldn't really worry about it. You might be asking yourself, what's the point of blade combos? Well, I'm glad you asked. By initiating chain attacks, you can use the elemental orbs you acquire during the battle to extend and strengthen these chain attacks. By damaging the enemy enough, you can end up overkilling an enemy, which gives you bonus XP. This is a fantastic change to chain attacks, where in Xenoblade Chronicles 1, they were kind of dumb. Bonus XP helped me a lot in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, as a problem I had in the original was that I had to grind so fucking much, and even at the end of the game, I had to switch to casual mode because Xanza was too tough for me. Exploring and changing the game is both easy, fun, and needed to fully enjoy the game. So first of all, here's something they didn't teach you in school. By merely moving your left analog stick after auto attack, you'll be able to auto attack again, making your arts recharge even faster. Oh yeah, I forgot to say that the arts recharge differently now. Different to Xenoblade Chronicles 1, with it recharging over time. Now you have to hit enemies with an auto attack first, which I'm guessing Mildsoft didn't notice how broken it was, because it makes combat that much faster and broken. If you've never played a Xeno game before, please stop this video at once and play the fucking games. They're all so good and unique with storytelling that's amazing. If you don't, you might not know that Xeno Saga and Xenoblade love to reference the previous titles in the Xeno franchise. First of all, the setting. Both Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2 take place on Titans, which is an incredibly unique way to tell a story. Near the end of the game, you'll realize that this and the original Xenoblade Chronicles are connected. Klaus is Zanza's other half, and the good side that would be opposite of Zanza's tyrannical lifestyle. And then, you hear the coolest fucking thing ever. Today, we use our power to fell a god, and then seize our destiny! The connections that are in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 are so good, and the full potential of the game doesn't appear until you play the original, especially with Shulk and Fiora being DLC blades. With it being likely, you won't enjoy the game as much if you haven't played the previous games in the trilogy. Oh, and also some characters here are references to past characters in the Xeno franchise, such as Zeke being inspired by Bart and Poppy being inspired by Esmeralda. This entire franchise is amazing, and while I haven't played all the entries, I'm glad I've had at least the chance to experience all these masterpieces. All the Xenoblade Chronicles have a different feeling compared to the rest. Xenoblade Chronicles 1 has a bigger focus on a grand scale. Xenoblade Chronicles X has a bigger focus on a huge adventure into the unknown. Xenoblade Chronicles 2, however, is focused on a magical feeling, which is amazing and I love it. While Xenoblade Chronicles 3 emphasizes a more mixture between the first and the second game, alongside feeling like an epic conclusion to the trilogy. Songs found in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 are simply amazing and one of my favorite soundtracks of all time. With tracks like Urea, You Will Recall Our Names, And one last you.
They're all beautiful, and the composers for Zimbla Chronicles 2 did a fantastic job. Whenever I hear One Last You, I tear up even if I'm in class. That's how big of an impact the game had on me. The environment themes are also some of the best in the entire franchise in my opinion. Uriah is filled to the brim with a mystical feeling, with flutes. More than gets your blood pumping, and Tantal really feels like an isolated country, covered in an eternal blizzard. See Black Chronicles 3 at least would disappoint me with his environment themes, though they're still good. But none can compare to more Ordain! The original Z-Blade Chronicles main issue with exploration was that areas were too big with nothing much to do in them. So Monolith Soft fixes that and makes areas more unique with more to do in them, yay! But then they make the world's worst compass ever, and I want to bash my head into the wall. Legit, they solved a big problem with the original but massively messed up, making navigation so hard to the point where I had to look up on YouTube where I was supposed to go in Uri and Tantal. Z-Blade Chronicles 3 of course would fix this, with the combination of Z-Blade Chronicles 1 and 2, which is the best of both worlds. Eventually, I hope they remaster and make a definitive edition of Z-Blade Chronicles 2 and, and bring it up to a higher standard that it deserves. The level design and spectacles here in Z-Blade Chronicles 2 are so unique, and it's such a damn shame that Monothsoft didn't think far ahead. Areas like Uriah, Tantal, Land of Mortha, and the World Tree are so incredibly unique, yet I've had issues trying to explore all of them. expansion is good when there's a lot of people who say that the expansion is better than the main game. Well, I disagree and hate them in my mind, but that does showcase the quality of Torn of the Golden Country. It's a prequel to the main game taking place around 500 years ago, and it fixes a lot of issues I had with the base game, combining with an emotional ending that still makes me tear up sometimes when I think about it. They touched up the combat to where you can actually play as your blades now, and I really like the new change. I find it better than the base game in that regard, due to that. Now switching between the drivers or the blades gives a new layer of strategy that I'll forever enjoy. Overall, it's a great expansion, except for the fact it has pacing issues near the middle. Specifically with you having to complete a lot of side quests. That made me drop the game for half a year before eventually coming back to the game and completing it. That's it for Torner for right now, but I might make a video about it one day if you guys want it. The endgame for Xenoblade Chronicles 2, to put it simply, is fucking insane. We discover that Elysium is a lie and a shell of its former self. It's all a dusty and, and deserted remnant of the old earth with no one here anymore. Finishing the game by itself is amazing, but the new game plus here is fantastic and the best in the series, even if it did take a while for it to be actually added to the game. Upon starting a new game plus, you get to keep all of your levels, blades, equipment, skills, items, and gold, and so much more. And that's not the end of it. With New Game Plus, you get even more content, including a new hidden infinity chart for all the drivers, a new level 4 special for some blades, Torna blades are unlockable now, a new ability for Zeke, rewards for EXP, leveling down, and accessory expander kits. Oh my god, that is so much. And I'm so happy that Monosoft gave us a meaty update. New Game Plus for Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is so good because it opens up so many possibilities for the player, and it's why, as of writing this video, I'm disappointed with Xenoblade Chronicles 3's current New Game Plus. So, I'm gonna talk about my favorite part of the game, uh, which is the endgame, but not the story endgame. Don't get me wrong, the, the final battle is fantastic, and uh, Elysium is uh, a great subversion of uh, expectation, the, um, the church battles are very, very impactful, even if uh, I couldn't complete uh, the Morag fight uh, for a while, uh, playing Dodge Morag with Corvin was a mistake, and the game punished me for that, for it. But uh, what I meant to talk about was the endgame super bosses. They're all a lot of fun, and they let you experiment with your builds. Once you have mastered uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 2's combat, uh, it becomes the easily the second best combat in the series but uh, being able to craft uh, blade teams uh, taking into account driver combos blade combos uh, team composition up until the end game where thanks to rex you can uh, equip other blades onto the main cast uh, taking out their locked ones because uh, i don't really like pandorian zeke she's a great character but uh, 
I think he has better blades. Um, while Morag Brigid is really good and Nia benefits as much as possible from not having draw mark. It was the first game that made me want to complete super bosses. The first game where reaching level 99 based on killing higher level enemies was both fun and rewarding. Once combat isn't hasn't aged the best, I rediscovered it with my definitive edition playthrough, um, which made them a lot more tedious. And uh, yeah, that's all. Uh, super bosses, really fun. End game combat, really fun. You can solo off him with Dodge Mitra. Honestly, even after beating Xenoblade Chronicles 3, I still think Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is probably my second favorite game of all time. While Xenoblade 3 is obviously a step up in terms of quality, I think there's many highs that Xenoblade 2 reaches that I just don't think Xenoblade 3 ever does reach at some points. But both are still better than Xenoblade 1. Uh -huh. Final day has come to an end. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is probably one of, if not my favorite game that I've ever played. Um, it's just, in terms of a game, it's just really fun. Uh, it's combat addicting, it's got incredible customization, and the blade system is great. I like the expansions on the first game. Um, but as an experience, like when you factor in the story and the characters, the world of the music, it's just, it really feels alive. And um, in fact, Xenoblade 2 probably has one of my favorite tracks of all time, that being Tomorrow With You. That's seriously, I love that track so much. Yeah, and you add, you add in Torna as well. Just, there's just so much to see and do and experience and all the rest. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, just a really incredible story with really touching characters that you want the best for, and they really make for a world that you want to live in. And uh, yeah, the best part is that uh, Mithra Beskar! Even with all the faults and issues that Xenoblade Chronicles 2 has, it achieves a lot and goes above and beyond the other games of the trilogy. While it may not be my favorite Xenoblade title anymore, it's still a fantastic game that I cherish and come back to a lot. There's a lot to love in this game with a large amount of unique blades, an entertaining challenge mode, and an amazing expansion that brings more to the table. At the end of the day, even if you do close this video and still don't like Xenoblade Chronicles 2, I do hope that you walk away with the knowledge that Xenoblade Chronicles 2 has a lot of good parts. Hey guys, I'm here to talk to you about Xenoblade 2. And Xenoblade 2 is a really good game. But I didn't really think about that, thinking about it that way for a while. When I first played the game in the year it came out, I was so excited. I finally get to try a new Z a Xenoblade game for the first time. I really hope it's gonna be really good. Mind you, I was 12 at the time, like, wow, this game isn't that fun. And then, fast forward through pretty much most of school, then COVID hit, and I'm stuck sitting there in online school. And I'm sitting there and be like, you know what? What if there's a Xenoblade 2 speed run? And then I stumbled upon an L speed run, a world record at the time. And what was really great about it was that I realized, wow, I'm just bad at video games. I'm going to give the game another chance. And what, what really ha helped me with this was that game, after playing it, for the whole way through, it really changed my life. Nia's character arc of being who you are really touched me on an emotional level. It's just the game, the characters, the combat. It's As someone who doesn't normally like RPGs, it's weird to call an RPG my favorite game of all time. I mean, everything about the game, the music, the characters, the writing is iffy in some parts, but I would say for the most part, it's pretty good. I really love the game to death. I even speed ran it a couple times. I might pick it up again. I'm honestly, t just talking about it, have a really big, big itch to pick it up and play it again. But you know, I just have to say, I really like Xenoblade 2. It is my favorite game of all time. I just can't think of a game that has helped me help me through more rough times in my life, given me a Twitch channel, a community that frankly, it's small, but I love to death. Although I may not stream it much anymore, I have to say, this game means so much to me. And thank you for listening to me rant about a game that came out when I was 12 years old. Bye. For me personally, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 just has an amazing set of characters that you just love to rock with the whole story. From characters from Rex to a robot named Poppy that's just the most precious little thing in existence for me. They're all just so great and you can love them to death. Then there are characters like Zeke that bring less tension to the party, at times at least, and even have a banger-ass song called Bringer of Chaos. Am 
I supposed to do an outro for this? What do you want from me? <laughs>